We're here at PRI 2014 with Drake from Motec USA and one of the cars that's really made a big impact on the internet this year is Ken Block's Hoonicorn. Now every year Ken Block releases uh, the latest of his Gymkhana updates and the Hoonicorn this year was obviously the star of the show. Now while that car's been all over the internet, there's probably not a lot of people know about the electronics package running that car and basically the car's running a full uh, Motec system. So uh, Drake, you are instrumental in getting that car up and running. Can we start by uh, getting a bit of insight into what what products are actually running that car? Yeah, sure. We uh, we started with we wanted to sort of promote some of our newest product lines that have just come out and are on the brink of coming out. So we put a full color dash in there, a C127 display. It's got a PDM15 that's running all of the all of the uh, components in there that require power. Uh, 12 volt supplies and then probably most interesting is what's running the engine it's a um, an M130 ECU and conveniently enough it's actually running our current GP release package which is uh, our general purpose package which is something that we developed to run basically any engine from a single cylinder all the way up to 12. Now let's go back for it, for those out there who aren't 100% familiar with all of the MoTeC uh, products. So let's start with the PDM15, so that's a power distribution module. Uh, can you give us a little bit of insight into how that power distribution module works? Now it's, a, it's a fairly basic car, uh, all things considered. What are you using that power distribution module to control? Yeah, the, the car itself is, is fairly basic as far as components goes. Um, but the strategy inside the car is actually pretty complicated. Uh, our, the display and the ECU and then the PDM, the power distribution module you're referencing, are all talking together over a CAN bus network. So the power distribution module is controlling when the fuel pump comes on, it monitors the engine temperature, and when the em engine temperature gets high enough, it turns the cooling fans on. Um, it supplies power to anything in the car that needs 12 volts, and, but it has uh, its own software setup to where we can control when and how uh, those components get delivered 12 volts. Uh, in addition to that, we can monitor the current draw and voltage and state of everything in the car. So we can send that back to the dash for the driver to see. We can log it so that we can monitor if a, if a component is failing. And it also um, uh, provides protection if a component does fail to make sure that there's no damage to the wiring harness or anything else in the car. And one of the things with those uh, power distribution modules for the reliability of a race car is the ability, uh, conventionally if, uh, if a fuse blows in the car, you've got to stop and actually replace that fuse. Maybe if you've got a quick reset circuit breaker, you can punch that back in, but still the driver actually has to stop and do something. With the PDMs, you can actually tune, uh, set those up in the software to retry a failed circuit a certain number of times, correct? That's correct. We uh, Each component has its own strategy applied to it, so we can tell it that we want it to retry. If it's something that's mission critical, like the fuel pump, we want the PDM to do everything it can to try to keep the fuel pump on all the time. If it gets a, a bit of grit or something stuck in it and it starts to stall the pump out and it shuts it off because it goes over current, the PDM will shut it down and then it'll retry it again. And then if that passes through, whatever the case may be, everything goes on as normal. The driver has no, no requirement to do anything. The whole system's automated. And probably another thing that, that uh, is going to be helpful if you're getting historical data on, on a car over a race series or over a number of years is you can monitor also the current draw on, say, that fuel pump. And if you uh, look at that historical data, you can actually start seeing that, that current start stepping up if the product is starting to wear out and it's getting close to failure. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of uh, when we do uh, endurance type racing, we can, have, we can send that data back through the dash over telemetry and then um, the crew chief or somebody in the, on the pit side can see that a pump normally draws steady state 10 amps or whatever it may be. We can see that it starts steadily going over time up to 11 amps, up to 12 amps, and be able to predict a failure is about to happen before it does and then replace that component. I mean, the idea is to keep the car on the track as much as you can, right? Absolutely. So let's talk about the M130 ECU. So again, this, this Roush Yates V8 that was 
powering the car. Uh, all things considered, while it's making a lot of power, it's a naturally aspirated V8. There's not a lot of complexity there. Uh, what strategies are you using in the uh, GPR package to control that that engine? Yeah, one of the uh, one of the we've done that engine with M800s before, uh, so we were pretty familiar with what the requirements were for uh, ignition timing and fueling. Uh, but because we went through and decided to use the M130 and and exercise the GP package in it. Um, there are some things that are unique to that engine where we had to use some special features of the GP package. One of them being is that because it's individual throttle bodies, we don't really have a usable manifold pressure signal. So being able to determine what the engine load is becomes difficult. Uh, so one of, the, one of the big features of GP is we have a manifold pressure estimate table. And what that allows us to do is based on, uh, call it an educated guess if you will, but some a lot of experience that I have from tuning lots of engines is to be able to look at uh, what the manifold pressure would be at a given throttle position and engine speed. And what we can do then is we can profile what we predict the manifold pressure to be in all conditions. And then the rest of the fuel model uh, in the M1 remains the same. And the, the, the benefit of the fuel model is that particular car actually never went on the dyno. It, it, did not, it did not make one pull on the dyno, even all the way up through the filming of that video. Uh, we used the fuel model in the M1 to tell it what the engine size was, what the injector type was, uh, fuel pressure, and then using this manifold pre estimate table, we could, uh, we could predict what the manifold pressure is, use a VE table that makes sense, and with some historic knowledge from what the engine does, how it performs on a dyno, and then be able to get something that can go straight out to a test and run. Now that, that's something I want to spend a little bit of time talking about because in the tuning world uh, the dyno is obviously uh, king and, and we talk about the need to spend the time probably calibrating uh, every engine, making sure that the fuel, the ignition timing is all perfect before the car ever turns a wheel out on the road. Uh, you've just kind of thrown all of that out the window and as you say this, this engine never ran on a dyno uh, which uh, probably would seem ludicrous to most people out there. So first of all you've obviously got a lot of experience with this particular engine so you're not going into a, a tuning or calibration project uh, with absolutely no idea of what you're expecting but it's that VE or volumetric efficiency model of the Motec M1 that makes uh, that gives you that ability really to, to get those results without a dyno? Yeah, it's the, the VE model, um, or the engine model if you will, that the, that the M130 GP uses uh, allows you to input some characteristics about the engine to give us enough info to where we can calculate what the engine load is going to be. And then what we do is we work that through a series of uh, volume and mass calculations between the amount of air mass that we expect and then work that back through what your desired air to fuel ratio is into delivering a fuel mass. And then ultimately, if we know the fuel type, we can deliver a fuel volume, is what, which is what an injector actually does. Um, so it works, it's a lot more complicated than that, of course. But ultimately, if, um, if you've run on the dyno, you've seen that your fuel map, uh, even in an M800, often mimics the torque curve of the engine, which is what volumetric efficiency is. So we, we allow, if you can come up with a volumetric efficiency table, assuming that you're going to get near or even in some cases more than the cylinder displacement of air in there, uh, you can start with 100. Say that you get complete cylinder filling, then and you have 100% VE, and you know what RPM the torque curve is, you should be able to create a map on paper that makes sense and will run the car at least, turn on lambda control if you want to, uh, to be safe, but it's going to run the engine correctly straight out of the box, just with an educated guess at what uh, the VE table looks like. And it sounds like that's exactly what the car did. It, by the sounds of it, didn't really put a foot wrong. Now, once you had that, that engine up and running and uh, Ken got the opportunity to test it, uh, did you actually end up doing much in the way of manipulating that base calibration uh, based on the data logging from the uh, air fuel ratio sensors in the exhaust? Um, yeah, we actually ran that engine, it was, at, it was kind of funny, we, we, did, we did almost no testing. Uh, we took the car over to the track, we waited for, for Ken and his team to show up, 
Uh, we got the, the, the engine warmed up, started and idled it back at the shop, made sure all of that was in good shape. He basically got in and you know, we didn't do any straight line runs, you know, not a drive across the, the parking lot or, or any steady state tuning to figure out what that was. He got in it and basically did what you see in the video. He started doing donuts, put some barrels out there and just wheeling them around them. You know, the whole car is covered in smoke on, on the VE table that we started with. So um, the process from there is to pick pieces out of the, the, the data that the ECU is logging, looking at the Lambda sensors and uh, on either side and, and picking as much information out of, you, out of it as you can to improve the calibration. But straight away, he was able to do almost anything that he wanted with the starting point. And of course when you've got a, a car like that where it's spending most of its time hanging up on that rev limiter, uh, the Lambda data you're going to get in that logging is, is less than useful anyway? Yeah, I mean when it's on, when it's on the limiter you, you're cutting cylinders and you often get a, uh, an artificially lean condition. Um, but in, in that case, it, it's also hard to tune a car like that because you're constantly changing load. Even at a fixed RPM and throttle, you've got different load conditions depending on how much traction you have, especially with it being all-wheel drive. Uh, that, that adds to the complexity of it. So you end up playing a bit of a game where you're working on the VE table because it's, it is kind of an educated guess and some experience applied, but you're also playing um, with your manifold pressure estimate table to see if your prediction for what the manifold pressure is is slightly off. So you have to work with both of them and massage it. Um, but it was straight out of the box. It was something that you could definitely go out, go to a racetrack if it's a race car, take that car, go out and start to do some testing from day one. It's, it's definitely a testament to how well that fuel model works. And we've talked about the fuel model, uh, obviously doing the ignition side of things, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, you don't really have a lot of feedback if you don't have the car on the dyno. Were you doing that from experience tuning these uh, engines previously on the 100 series ECUs? Yeah, from <clears throat> excuse me, from uh, from work we had done with that engine before, we had good, uh, and I would call them conservative ignition tables. So we didn't really have to worry about knock control, even though the, the GP system has a full knock control system in it. We didn't really need to use it. And the, another reason we don't really have to use it is because the car's always spinning the tires the load isn't really that high on the engine. Uh, so it's, it's not really a, a high knock scenario. Uh, so what we did was we just ran, it had plenty of torque. There was, no lack of, there was no lack of torque. So being able to push the limits of the ignition system wasn't really necessary. Yeah, um, from my own perspective, if you tune a car, maybe it goes to the drag strip or the track that, that first time it goes out there, there's always sort of a little bit of apprehension. You know, is everything going to work correctly? Is it going to do what you expected? And uh, you had a little bit more riding on this. You know, the whole of uh, LA is closed down uh, for Ken to do this filming for a week. Uh, how, was the, uh, how was the nerves for that first day of filming? Um, it, it, it has the... It has the same sort of anticipation that you would expect. I mean, you, we obviously have a very integral part of it. Uh, the engine doesn't run if we don't get our, our part of it right and the power distribution all the way through. Uh, so you obviously don't want to be the guy that's out there working on your subsystem on a, on a, on a, uh, on a uh, production like that uh, on such a grand scale. Uh, so the nerves were shot, you know, you're going through the night before making sure you've got all your bases covered. Uh, but, you know, the first time that engine starts up and it sounds like it's supposed to, it all goes away. You know, you know you've done your job correctly. Um, and then you just enjoy the ride. You just enjoy watching the, the whole thing happen. Oh, you definitely, it uh, looks like you nailed it. At that video is just amazing, 14 million views in one week, but uh, thanks for giving us a little bit more insight into uh, the electronics behind that system and, and also how you went about calibrating it. Thanks for chatting to us. Absolutely. It was, uh, it was a great project and very glad to be a part of it. For online tuning courses, visit learntotune.com.